Okay, so what are some things that we covered in Gen Chem 1? Well, back way back in Chapter 1, uh, we talked about the states of matter. Solid, liquid, gas. We mentioned plasma. We also said we weren't going to be covering plasma really in General Chemistry 1 because of things. Um, we talked about physical versus chemical properties. We gave those examples of melting versus burning. So physical, you're not really reorganizing the way atoms are connected to one another, whereas in chemical uh, changes, you are. And so that's kind of a thing to consider when you're thinking about physical versus chemical properties. Um, we went through all those different SI units of measurement, and we've been using those like ad nauseum for the rest of the semester. So hopefully those are pretty uh, ingrained in your head. We did sig figs. We've been using that for a long time, and we've talked about density a bazillion times. Um, the atomic theory um, and back in general chemistry, or I'm sorry, chapter two was we kind of started talking about like this whole progression of, um, how we went from kind of that plum pudding model, or we figured out there was the plum pudding model after we figured out electrons exist. Um, and then we went to the nuclear atom with Rutherford's experiments. Um, we, so that was the whole, like the, most of the atom is empty space. Uh, with the electrons dancing around the nucleus, and the nucleus was made up of protons and of neutrons. We talked about isotopes. What's the difference in isotopes of an element? There's, There's more, more or a different, different number, number of neutrons. neutrons. Yeah, protons are held constant, but the neutrons change. Yep. Okay, we talked about ions. What's an ion? It's, it's um, um, has, has either, either a positive, positive or negative, or negative, negative, negative charge, charge to the electrons. electrons. Yeah, we've changed our electron count. So we've either taken a molecule and we've changed its electron count by adding or decreasing. And so that was like the polyatomic ions, or we took an element, a uh, single atom of an element, and we changed the number of protons or electrons. So we had cations or anions. We talked through the whole description of atomic mass, um, and we talked about how we related that, um, the whole AMU thing to carbon. Um, specifically C12, so the isotope of carbon, C12. Um, and we did math, and we showed how then the rest of the elements on the periodic table have their average atomic masses. So we take all of the different isotopes and all of their ratios, and we even did some problems where we said, like, hey, if this is, like, 43% C12 and the rest of it is C14, that's not the real ratios for those, what's the average atomic mass? And so we did those kinds of problems. We even got into moles. So what's the important thing about moles? Uh, mole, one, one mole, mole of an element is the atomic mass. Yeah, yeah, so it's the grams, grams of the element. element. Yeah, so one mole we can look on the periodic table and say, what's our average atomic mass? And we say that's one mole of our stuff. Yep. And a mole is a, like, it's a number. It's one of those 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd numbers. Um, not numbers, it is that thing. It's a way for us to say we have a lot of these molecules because molecules are really small. So that's a thing. Um, we've got ionic bonds. We talked about how those are attracted via columbic interactions, covalent bonds. And back in chapter three, we just kind of said, hey, these are a thing where we share electrons, but we didn't really describe why. But we did that later in the semester. So ionic and covalent bonding, you should have really good and down pat. Um, elements versus molecules, what's the difference? Elements. That thing you see on the periodic table and molecules, molecules is what is made, made up, up by... by Multiple. That's well, it. Else. Yep. With a molecule, you're going to have to have multiples of the things from the periodic table. Um, and we can even have molecular elements. It's not really quite the, what we say, but we have diatomic elements, for example, like hydrogen, um, where it takes two of the same atom to make one molecule, and that's what we find in nature. 
we in chapter three did a ton of naming so we had all different kinds of inorganic ionic compounds so um we had type one and type uh type one type two so i never remember them in that ways but basically we had metals with non-metals and then it was metals from the alkali or alkaline earth um portions of the periodic table versus transition metals and a non-metal so you had to designate what the oxidation state via roman numerals were for the metals when appropriate uh, we also had um naming uh with polyatomics there and you could also to some degree say that from for our class most of our acid naming was really just a form of inorganic ion compound naming um we talked about covalent compound naming and we did the acid naming we did chemical formulas which were really fun we talked about empirical formulas versus molecular formulas um, we did some math where we showed like hey if you're given this kind of information for empirical formula um you can figure out what the empirical formula was so that was kind of those combustion kinds of processes where we said like we have 0 0.5 grams of our starting material after combustion we had 0 0.12 grams of carbon dioxide and 0 0.3 grams of water what was our original uh, empirical formula of our compound those kinds of problems then we started finally getting into in the end of chapter three and in the beginning of chapter four into writing balance equations and stoichiometry. Writing a balance equation and stoichiometry are like hand in glove. They just go together. We did limiting reactant. We did theoretical yield, percent yield. These are things that we've done in a variety of ways. We did these with um, all kinds of problems, including solution problems. And solution is really what a lot of chapter four is all about. Um, like molarity, what's the definition of molarity? It's the, the amount, amount of, of the solute, solute over, over the, the volume. Ah, so it's our moles of solute over liters of solution. Yeah, so when we have a given solution, we've got our solute, our solvent, and together they form our solution. Um, so think of Kool-Aid and water. So our Kool-Aid powder would be our solute, the water would be our solvent, and together they make our Kool-Aid solution. So molarity is moles of solute divided by liters of solution. We talked about dilutions. Um, in my class, we went over M1V1 equals M2V2, and we said that you have to make sure that you're using it right. Um, but if you do use that equation right, then you're set. Um, but it's only good for dilutions. So that's taking one solution and making it weaker. You can't actually do any kind of chemical reactions with M1V1 equals M2V2. We did precipitation reactions, and in order to do a precipitation reaction, you have to know your solubility rules. So those were a thing. We did equations with aqueous reactions, which were really just reactions. It's just now we're doing uh, our reagents or reactants are mixing while they're in the aqueous phase. And we have to remember what the precipitation rules are because we're probably going to have um, either a, a precipitate form or we're going to have gas evolution. Talked about molecular equation, total ionic equation, net ionic equation, which were all absolutely linked with one another. And then finally, uh, a specific kind of aqueous reaction, acid base, and then a uh, at the very end kind of gas evolution reactions. So chapter four is kind of when we really got into chemistry, if you will, like we started like actually doing what you do most of the time in chemistry. Chapter five was our gases. And we applied all of our previous stuff. So your simple gas laws like Boyle's law, because Boyle rules. That's not how that phrase actually goes. I know, don't at me. Um, that's really Doyle. The but the law is Boyle. We did PV equals NRT. From PV equals NRT, we could figure out stuff like gas density. We did Dalton's laws of partial pressures, gas stoichiometry reactions, which are just like chemical reactions that we've done before. 
we have the concept of, concept of standard temperature and pressure, and we walked through kinetic molecular theory. So there was a lot of different kinds of math that are involved in chapter five, but those are the main concepts. It's just different math problems to solve through that. Chapter six, we take a walk on the wild side with thermochemistry. We got work, heat, internal energy. So that was the E or delta or U and the delta E, delta U stuff that we did. First law of thermodynamics, which is? Uh, dun, dun. We're neither creating nor destroying energy. Ah, uh, yes. It's just getting transferred from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. And from that first law of thermodynamics, we start talking about system versus surroundings. Uh, we did heat capacity, so that's the Q equals MC delta T stuff. Um, we did enthalpy, which was like a really crazy concept, but turned out that it was pretty important. Calorimetry, um, which directly related back with the specific heat capacity, so MC Q equals MC delta T. Uh, if it was constant pressure, if it was not constant pressure, then we had to use constant volume calorimetry, which we set up the equation differently. Uh, we calculated the enthalpy of reaction for things, and we did those Hess's law problems, which I call them the chemical Tetris. You just keep mixing and twisting the pieces around until it all syncs up nicely, and then you call it a day. Home stretch. Chapter seven feels like we, it just feels like yesterday we were in chapter seven because it almost yeah. was because <laughs> that's only funny to me. Um, in chapter seven, we started talking about the nature of light a lot, specifically the characteristics of a wave. So we said waves have wavelength, they have speed and they have frequency. And so that C equals lambda nu gives us the relationship there. We talked about photons and how we treated photons as discrete packets of energy. Um, and that was the E equals H nu equation. And that goes right into the energy of a photon. We did the whole de Broglie wavelength of an atom. Um, with the de Broglie wavelength, that was the whole, that macroscopic objects, like objects in our view, uh, have wave-like properties. It just that those waves were... Uh, practically impossible to measure because of the mass of the objects. So when you look at that equation, the wavelengths are just ridiculous. And so um, we don't observe them, but strictly speaking, they are there. We did the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So we started out with that Rutherford model of the atom, and then we expanded that out. Um, and we did the Bohr model of the atom. We talked about why the Bohr model of the atom works for a one electron system, but we needed something more complicated for a multi electron system. Um, and so we then went to the de Broglie wavelength or the de Broglie model of the atom. And then finally, we landed out in the quantum mechanical model of the atom, which required our four quantum numbers. What are the letters for our four quantum numbers? Uh, we have N, mm -hmm. which is just the principal quantum number. number. Mm hmm. L, which is the angular, angular momentum. momentum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, M is a L. L. Uh -huh. The magnetic, magnetic one. one. Yep. And M is a S. Yep. Which is our spin. spin. Yep. And so those came out of solving the wave function um, and using the Hamiltonian and all that jazz. Um, that's in your book, but we said, yeah, here's the end result. And the nice thing from that was we were able to talk then about in chapter eight trends from our periodic table, like atomic sizes. And Hey, look, the number of valence electrons as we go down up here, uh, go down on our periodic table, the number of valence electrons stays the same as we go across. We're adding one extra electron to the valence electron. Um, and that led us to be able to use our four quantum numbers and the information that they give us to write out electron configurations for atoms. And I'm just going to keep hitting the mic and make lots of noise. We talked about effective nuclear charge and the trends that effective nuclear charge had on our atomic size. We had the conversation about as you add or take away electrons and what that does to our, our uh, atomic size. 
We talked about ionization energy and electron affinity briefly and what that does to atomic size and when ionization increase, energy increases versus when it decreases. Before getting into chapter 9, and chapter 9, 10, uh, pretty much just all blended together. Because in 9, we reviewed ionic versus covalent bonding. We did Lewis structures and electronegativity, uh, polar versus nonpolar bonds, as well as then how that leads to polar versus nonpolar molecules. And in order to check our Lewis structures, we had to have this idea of resonance and formal charges to make sure that we were drawing the most correct Lewis structure. Um, as well as from always keeping in mind the octet rule and its exceptions. And then we said, cool, that Lewis structure stuff is really nice, but how does that actually make three-dimensional molecules? What does a three-dimensional molecule look like? And so then we went into Vesper theory, which gave us electron geometries and molecular geometries. And from those electron and molecular geometries, we had a bigger, better discussion about polarity of molecules. In our valence, which is spelled wrong, Valence, balance, valence bond theory. We described um, how just the valence electrons were the ones that were being involved in uh, bonding. Um, so for covalent bonding, and then how that related in with hybridization, where we took all of our different atomic orbitals that existed, put them in a blender, and said, "Ha ha! This is what we're forming." And then the shapes worked out. Finally, in chapter 11, it was just intermolecular forces and how uh, the properties of solids, liquids, and gases can be better understood uh, by using uh, or by having knowledge of what those intermolecular forces are and how the intermolecular forces are directly influenced by their molecular shapes and polarity. Congratulations, that was General Chemistry 1 in 17 minutes. Woohoo! You all right? 